God be with you. Welcome to our worship today at Faith Lutheran Church in Kelowna, B.C. Today is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. We continue to read in our Old Testament uh, from the Abraham cycle of stories. And the Gospel is again from the Gospel appointed for this year, uh, year A, the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Next week we will be having communion again, and so you'll need to prepare ahead of time uh, bread and wine or juice for that purpose. So we begin today with a brief order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may be life in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together Amazing Grace.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, who direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. First reading from Genesis 22, verses 1 to 14. Abraham was prepared to obey God's command amid extreme contradiction. The child to be sacrificed is the very child through whom Abraham is to receive descendants. God acknowledged Abraham's obedient faith, and Abraham offered a ram in place of his son Isaac. Here begins the reading. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on the, one of the mountains that you shall I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his don donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and said, set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here that with the donkey, and the boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. So after Abraham and took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on, the son, on his son Isaac, and he said, carried the, he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them went together walked together, Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown them, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. The angel said, to, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For no, now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went to the, took the ram, offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, and it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a thick wallet, not because there is so much money in it, but because it is jammed with so many plastic cards. Some of them I use on a daily basis or a weekly basis, like my bank debit card, 
or my credit card. Other cards I use occasionally, like my Costco membership card. But the great majority of the plastic cards in my wallet are reward cards. Air Miles, PC Optimum, Save On More, Petro Points, and Starbucks, just to name a few. My wallet gets so full of cards every now and then that I have to go through my wallet to discard those that I no longer use or I use so rarely that I don't have to carry them around with me wherever I go. And if I can't find a particular card in my wallet, it's probably somewhere in the stack of reward cards and punch cards that sit in the console of my car. I guess I'm a bit of a sucker for those reward programs, but it's an easy rabbit hole to fall down because who doesn't love a reward? I mean, I'm getting the coffee or the sandwich or whatever anyway, I may as well earn a few points while I'm doing it. Over time, those points add up and before you know it, you have yourself a reward. It's nice to get rewarded. I like getting the notifications that I've earned a free item. I know I'm not the only one who likes these reward and loyalty programs because I see other people standing at the checkout, sifting through stacks of cards as they pay. Rewards are nice. Getting a reward makes us feel good, makes us feel like we have accomplished something, like we've done something worthwhile, like we've done something worthy of being rewarded. But if we think about it, these reward programs can be deceiving because if a company needs to increase their prices so that they can cover the cost of giving me a reward and giving me that fleeting moment of feeling good and valued, then it hardly seems worth it. It's why some people don't bother joining any programs at all. Just avoid the whole racket altogether. Don't get fall prey to master manipulation. Lighten your wallet and simplify your life. Sometimes it's just not worth it. I can see the wisdom in that. The phenomenon of reward cards and loyalty programs is so pervasive that the kind of thinking upon which it is based can unknowingly creep into other areas of our life. We innocently and unwittingly think along these lines about other things, too. Take the words of Jesus from our Gospel reading today. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. It's hard not to hear these words and not think of it as a, a transaction. Do this, get that. Most people will hear these words and conclude that Jesus is commanding us to welcome the stranger. Welcome the stranger, the prophet, the righteous one, the little one, says Jesus. And it will be like you are welcoming me. And if you welcome me, then you will be rewarded. That certainly does sound like a do this, get that scenario. It may not be a reward like we get from one of our loyalty programs. It may merely be the reward of knowing that we have done a good thing or done the right thing. But there is that, that little hit of endorphin that we get from doing it and therein lies the transaction. But is that really the way it is with God? We know God to be the one who longs to bless us. We know God to be the giver of the best gifts, like faith or eternal life. Does that make God into a God of rewards? I don't think so. The God that Jesus came proclaiming is not a transactional God, but a relational God. The God we meet in the scriptures and the God whom we worship is not a God who relates to us with treats. I cannot relate to a God like that. In order to get away from that idea of a transactional God, we need to ask a different question. We need to hear these words of Jesus differently. Instead of asking, what do Jesus' words ask me or command me to do? We need to simply ask, what do Jesus' words mean? 
That way we get away from a transactional do this, get that mentality and embrace a more relational do this, be that mindset. Not everything Jesus says is some sort of moral commandment or instruction. Many times, Jesus is inviting us into a relationship with God and with our neighbor. The clue to this being relational rather than transactional is contained in what Jesus says before he mentions anything about getting rewards or losing rewards. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Notice that Jesus here says, whoever welcomes you, Jesus says you. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. Jesus is placing his hearers not in the place of the ones offering the welcome, but rather in the place of the ones receiving the welcome. We are not the doers, we are the receivers. That turns this saying from a commandment into a promise. The promise is that whenever we are welcomed, we become the manifestation of the presence of Christ for others. And if there is to be a reward to be had in that, then it's not ours, but it belongs to the one who welcomes us. That can be a very freeing thing. It means that we need not worry about how we will gain any reward or what we need to do to garner God's love or affection. The promise is that God loves us without condition and with, without our doing anything to achieve it. By virtue of being in a relationship with others, by simply being available to others, being available to be welcomed by them, the presence of Christ is made known in us and through us and among us. It turns the tables from something we are being asked to do to something we are being encouraged to be. It turns being a disciple from something we do to something we are or some way that we are. Discipleship and the following in the way of Jesus is more of a function of who we are and how we are than what we do or accomplish. That can take off the pressure considerably. It means that we can relax into the grace of God and just be. Just be the people God has created us to be. Just be the people that Jesus has called us to be. Just be the presence of Christ in our own small way, in our own small circles of friends or neighbors. It means that even if all we can do is offer a cool cup of water to a little one, that is enough. In fact, it is more than enough because we are promised that when we do that, it is as if Christ himself were doing it. It means that discipleship does not have to be heroic. Many times, being a disciple of Christ and following in the way of Jesus is not complicated or difficult. It can be as simple and as modest as being open to the gift of others. Here in the 10th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is instructing his disciples in the way they are to be disciples. We've read the past two weeks about how they are to go without taking much with them and to accept the hospitality of strangers. Jesus tells them it's not always going to be easy and some days it will be downright miserable. But as he concludes here, Jesus wants to encourage his disciples and then let them know that when it comes right down to it, they don't have to worry about who is really benefiting or who gets the rewards because we are all there as participants in God's saving and redeeming and renewing work. We are participants in what God is doing and how God is blessing the world. Ultimately, the game belongs to God and there is sufficient reward in that for us. Amen. Go now by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be the church in mission, to do the will of God in the world. Amen.
we sing together, all are welcome. Church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
called into unity with one another and the whole creation. Let us pray for our shared world saying, Hear us, O God, and your mercy is great. God of companionship, encourage our relationship with our siblings of, in Christ. Bless our conversations, shape our f shared future, and give us hearts eager to join a joyful shout of praise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and through grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for one, our environment and be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities, judges, politicians to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, meet hate with love, and welcome the one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Comfort those who are sick, lonely, and abandoned, especially those we name aloud or silently in our hearts. Strengthen those who are in prison or awaiting trial. Renew the spirit of all who call upon you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission and vision to recognize where we are, you are leading us. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Teach, hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of love, you gather into your embrace all who have died. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And this is the final Sunday of June and is usually the Sunday before everybody takes off for a summer vacation and that may well be the case, uh, but the vacations are likely going to be a lot closer to home these days. And I thought that we should have a special blessing, a special prayer 
uh, as we go about on our travels, uh, praying also that we have a safe homecoming. And so, let us pray. O God, whose glory fills the whole creation, and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve all who will travel this summer. Surround them with your loving care, protect them from every danger, and bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing our final hymn, Where Cross the Crowded Ways of Life. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.